Uh, hello, everyone. Again, this is uh, Clay, and I just wanted to try and hit on a couple of the big themes that Francis, but before Francis, Dan and Margaret raised. Now, remember, everybody is counting on you. Uh, we've always counted on teachers. Francis just highlighted that. But this is what matters, is what you are going to do with uh, the content over the next couple of days. One of the things that I want to remind you of is that the sponsoring organizations and a whole lot more have some wonderful materials available for you to consult. Uh, so the Asia Society, the China File Program, and a whole lot more are available there. Uh, the National Consortium for Teaching About Asia, that includes Stanford, Columbia, a whole lot of uh, universities, including USC. But also, I want to mention, of course, my home, my home unit, uh, the USC, US China Institute. And one of the things that was highlighted here by everybody so far is the question of talent. Everybody, everything is going to turn on access to talent. And one of the foremost experts on China's talent programs is Professor David Zweig, who teach, uh, taught for a long time at the University, uh, University of Science and Technology in Hong Kong. And he has spoken, he's done a lot of research on this. You can go to our website and watch his discussion. Now, one of the technologies, uh, we have teachers who teach uh, at the elementary level, at the middle school level, the high school level. One of the key technologies of the early, or early civilization was figuring out where things were and how you could share that information, right? So once you were able to get beyond a stick on the ground, you could create a map, reproduce this map. Here is a map. And Dan, I thought of this when Dan was speaking because behind him, he had that technological uh, innovation. Now, one of the things that's interesting for those of us who teach about China or teach world history is that one of the earliest mechanisms for the Jesuits and others to get into China was technological prowess, geographical and astronomical knowledge. And so that's something you can talk about with students. Now, that's not a contemporary story, it's going way back, but a very important one. Remember, technology is what? How we do things. And there have been technological innovations throughout history, including many uh, that are quite well known from China. And here you have these New Year's posters uh, that were, these are modern creations of traditional uh, representations. And these are women at work in some cases spinning, in some cases weaving, doing different kinds of things. And thinking about the connections between gender and economic role, that's one of the things that we need to teach about. And so this is an example of something like that. Now, somebody asked in the forum about TikTok and questions about TikTok. And so TikTok, of course, is the first Chinese-owned um, Chinese app to go global. Alibaba is dominant, WeChat is dominant, but primarily focused on China. TikTok, however, is the all the world except China version of Douyin. Douyin dominates within China, these short videos. And it's a subject of some controversy, some discussion. Some people think it needs to be banned. And we'll touch on bans in just a little bit. But here we have, the first place it was banned was the US military. But here we have actually a US soldier using TikTok to share something. So this Chinese company owned app. And here we have American soldiers together with soldiers from the Republic of Korea, from South Korea, and they are engaged in cultural exchange. Thank <laughs> you. 
Gangnam style. And uh, again, that's what soldiers have been doing with this. You'll also see language lessons, all sorts of things. Why ban TikTok? Well, there's concerns about location information and other issues. And we'll have time, hopefully, in the breakout sessions and throughout the course of the two days to look at this. Now, the revolution, this technological revolution that was highlighted by Francis has that big e-commerce component. And of course, China is a giant consumption story. And he mentioned Singles Day, a manufactured holiday to generate sales. And does it generate sales? Uh, so last year, $58 billion in a single day. And it's televised, okay? It would be like watching lines outside of some uh, retail establishment here in the United States, seeing how much business is being transacted. But what I want to emphasize here is that what Alibaba did was not just the same thing that others might do. What they did is break down distribution hurdles. So people in smaller cities, in Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou, you have access to everything. But if you're in a smaller place, you might not. You might have the money to buy these things, but you wouldn't have access to it. And so e-commerce helps to shatter that. At the same time, e-commerce may not be an ideal solution. Uh, having you know, delivery folks running around delivering one item, one item, may not also be the best thing for the environment, for efficiency all these kinds of things. So there are dark clouds on the consumption horizon. Uh, we've seen some of that, but where it's definitely booming is in making, I'm having some trouble here, making uh, in-person shopping gigantic. And so what we have here is the opening of the first Costco in Shanghai and huge crowds. They had to somehow regulate this. Now this is pre-COVID-19, so just flooding in. And Costco was already known to Chinese consumers because Chinese here in the United States were taking their viewers on tours of Costco, good stuff you can buy. And so when Costco actually opens its doors, there's a huge, huge audience. Sam's Club has been there for a long time, a quarter century, and is doing business. So the rise of e-commerce hasn't eliminated in any way access to these other things. Now, some people asked uh, a question here in the Q&A section, and it's something that Dan raised, and that's the question of perceptions or opinions. And I'd like to share with you uh, some data here that comes from the Pew Research Center. Uh, it's a foremost public opinion polling operation. They work with pollsters in different countries, a really reliable group, and one that you should send your students to to look at. And they used to be able to carry out polls in China, but it's become an issue in China in recent years. So exactly what the masses think, we have less scientific information for. But for American perceptions of China, it's really, a really a downward trend. And we need to pay attention to this. The majority of Americans have an unfavorable opinion of China. And this is so pronounced that now you're looking at something three out of four Americans have a negative opinion of China. And it's gotten worse just in the last three or four months. So if you look, for example, in 2013, of the majority of young people, people between 18 and 30, had a positive view. But in this most recently uh, completed survey just a couple weeks ago, we see only about a third have a positive view of China. And that's in the under 30 crowd. If you look at the 50 and older crowd, 
it's very difficult to find someone who says, hey, I, I think China's doing a good thing or having a favorable impression. Now, there's a lot of things that go into an impression. Questions about human rights, questions about trade, questions about security, all sorts of things factor in. And the pollsters do ask specific questions to try to get at what are the biggest issues. So, but, you know, in your mind, favorable, unfavorable, where am I? And you can see that many Americans are quite negative. And so this is an issue for us to consider. Uh, and especially to see this dramatic drop just in three months. And I would suggest that's got political, a political connection. And maybe we can touch upon that. Sorry, every time someone asks a question, uh, my computer screen freezes. Now, what has driven the opinion of China down? More than anything else, it's the response to the new the novel uh, coronavirus. And we see this in this February, uh, this February Economist magazine cover, How Bad Will It Get? The Chinese Flag as a Mask over China. And in fact, of course, that mask needed to be global uh, because the disease isn't just a Chinese disease, it's a human disease and it has spread worldwide. So much so that we have here in the United States 150,000 uh, fewer Americans than we would have had without this virus. That's a tragic loss, uh, obviously for the individuals, for their families, for their communities. It's a loss to the United States. At about the same time, Business Week came out with this fragile China, that China is fragile. And this, all of this has percolated and is really driving negative impressions of China. And so we should spend some time talking about those things, especially when we're talking about uh, the connection between technology and humanity, how technology has helped, uh, places like China, Taiwan, South Korea, cope with the virus and contain it in such a way that it's not as it is in the United States, uh, you know, still spreading rampantly. Uh, so it's a big, a big issue for us to think about. Now, I mentioned the political dimension. So a couple months ago, uh, some political consultants said, here's what we can do. And so we've seen a political drumbeat emphasizing China's connection. And so Mike Pompeo, uh, the former congressperson, the former director of the CIA, and now the secretary of state, he's used these, the, these terms, Wuhan virus, China virus, this sort of thing. And of course, that's led to some really disgusting things that have happened within the United States, where some people have targeted uh, people of Asian ancestry for hate speech, physical abuse, a real problem, a real problem, and one that hasn't dissipated. It still exists, even though, of course, this is completely unwarranted, unfair, and not worthy of us. Now, one of the things that uh, Francis highlighted was that we've seen some of this movie before. Uh, so if you go back a little bit better than 30 years to the Reagan administration to the 1980s, there was this kind of tension with Japan. And there was a lot going on during this time. And there was also uh, a certain amount of racial discrimination that was, uh, that was brought up Prime Minister Nakasone at one point said, the reason these Americans can't compete is because of ethnic minorities. He later retracted that remark and you know, the relationship between uh, President Reagan and Prime Minister Nakasone continued, but there was a lot of tension. And in 19, uh, as, as you heard about, in 1987, we get the imposition of tariffs. Uh, dramatic 100% tariffs on select products. And we see that highlighted. Now, as it happens, the person that Nakasone sent to the United States 
to negotiate with President Reagan and Vice President Bush was the father of the current, uh, the father of the current uh, Prime Minister of Japan. And the current Prime Minister of Japan, hey, he knows America. He's lived in America. He has studied in America. He was at Cal State Long Beach, uh, strengthening his English. He studied public policy at USC. He made a return in 2015, spoke to the US Congress on the anniversary of the conclusion of World War II, talked about that sort of thing. Together with President Obama, Prime Minister Nakasone sought to move past what happened 70 years ago. And so we have President Obama in Hiroshima, we have Prime Minister Nakasone at the memorial uh, in Pearl Harbor. And of course, Prime, uh, Prime Minister Abe has worked uh, to forge strong ties with the current occupant of the White House, uh, President Donald Trump. Now, let's talk about the bullet train. The Japanese created the bullet train. The, ja the Chinese have blown it up and have built more kilometers than any other country. In fact, several countries combined. It's not even close. Now, one of the pe people who was impressed by that was Deng Xiaoping. Francis mentioned that. But here in California, our governor, Governor Jerry Brown, son of a former governor, Pat Brown, who's famous for building all sorts of projects, uh, he wanted to do it too. And so there was a big push. And it wasn't just confined to California. Other places, Ohio was thinking about, let's get fast trains. Let's make this happen. Uh, at that point, somebody interviewed Jerry Brown, and he said, here's the problem. The highway lobby is driving it, not those who think that mass transit in the form of bullet train would be successful. But in the last year of his administration, the first administration, Jerry Brown managed to get a bullet train pl plan passed. And it wasn't the big one to run all through California, but one that would uh, connect Los Angeles and San Diego. Now, it's been almost 40 years. There is no bullet train between Los Angeles and L and uh, between Los Angeles and San Diego. So much, much to do. But these are not the only political factors. Our current president, Donald Trump, he in fact attacked President Reagan for not being tough enough with regard to Japan, not being tough enough with regard to Germany and these other thing, other countries. He said, we should not defend them, we should not spend. There was a disconnect then and now between the idea of the United States has soldiers and puts resources in these areas, not just for the defense of those areas, but for the defense of the United States, thinking that it's much better to be on the front lines than to come uh, from a distance. Now we see the tensions with China. Uh, these are not new. There have been tensions in previous administrations. President Obama, President uh, George W. Bush imposed tariffs on various Chinese products at various times. But the current administration has sought to redefine China as a strategic competitor, a strategic rival. And so what was the argument? And we saw this argument very early in December 2017. U.S. policy here, they explain, U.S. policy was too focused on engagement and not understanding that China could represent a threat, that China's economy would grow, that China's military would grow, this sort of thing. And so that became an issue. And so what do we see the Trump administration doing? They say, here's the problem. Access to the innovation economy, we need to curtail that. And access to world-class universities, we need to curtail that. And what has happened since then is part of that. Now, <laughs> it seems like a long time ago, but the United States and China actually agreed to a bit of a truce in the trade war. And we actually haven't seen how much has changed because COVID-19 has so overwhelmed us. 
uh, it's a giant, a giant issue. But the trade war loomed large for both economies, and there was the hope that we could move forward. Now, I'm under all kinds of time pressure, but I've got to highlight a couple of things with regard to technology. Most Americans take generic medication. Most of the genetic medications come from India, but the active pharmaceutical ingredient in those medications primarily comes from China. And so when China went down, when it went into lockdown, there was a fear that medicines might not be available in the United States and elsewhere. Uh, and so we started to look at supply chains. In addition to pharmaceuticals, drugs, also medical devices, a big dependence. So some decoupling might be strategically smart to build resilience into our supply chains. But as was already explained, decoupling is just not really possible. Our economies are so intertwined that trying to decouple actually threatens ourselves. So one of the things that has come up is China's industrial plan. And China, like other East Asian countries, has industrial plans, has always done this. The United States has done some of it as well, maybe not quite as comprehensively. But China's Made in China 2025, it was announced in 2015, and it was trumpeted throughout the Chinese media, but it was when foreigners took note, uh, the US-China Business Council, the Chamber of Commerce, the Europeans, they didn't like this plan because what it did was it put forward the idea that China would be the dominant player within China in these technologies. And the plan said governments need, at different levels, need to find ways to support the development of these technologies, artificial intelligence, robotics, electric vehicles, green energy, these sorts of things. And we had this uh, produced by a think tank in uh, in Europe, and it used a sun model, and the closer you are to the sun, the greater the danger. So you see that sort of thing. Now, once it became an issue in the United States, once it was brought up by the U.S. Uh, trade representative, what happened? The Chinese said, on, the, on this particular chart, what you see is Chinese press mentions, okay, of Made in China 2025. And it's solid. Every day there's something. Almost none in the American press. But once the trade war started, it became a daily theme. At the same time, the Chinese said, well, this is making them unhappy. Let's stop talking about it. But why does China need to develop it on the technology side? This is why. Because right now, China is a net importer of property. Now, this is not about stealing or counterfeit or anything like that. This is stuff that actually Chinese companies and consumers buy. They pay license fees or they buy the products. And you see that the big exporter of intellectual property to China is the European Union. Uh, the United States is a giant exporter. Japan is. South Korea. South Korea, much smaller, but it is a player. China, not at all. China is an importer. China depends on intellectual property from these other places. It sees this as a giant economic weakness. And so it's trying to address this. And in China, turn, the, turn this down. In China, any sort of initiative has a propaganda uh, you know, uh, uh, steamroller behind it, books, newspapers, magazines, and a TV show. And this TV show, the opening, uh, highlights all of the kinds of creations that China is busy at doing, trying to enter aeronautics, uh, high-speed rail, all of these other kinds of products. And the idea is that China must innovate. Innovation is life. And so you get this push because it's seen. 
Are Chinese innovative? Absolutely. In fact, last year, Fast Company, this magazine that tracks some of this, they highlighted as one of the most innovative, the most innovative com company in the world, Meituan Dianping, uh, which is best known in China for bringing you munchies, bringing you foods, uh, that sort of thing, but also is the number one uh, destination for people who are uh, you know, securing hotel rooms and things like that. Uh, Fast Company also recognized Grab, Disney, and the NBA. So yeah, there's plenty of innovation in China. Here, Business Week is celebrating Meituan. Uh, if you'd like to know a little bit more about this, again, there's, there's plenty on it, including on our website, uh, an interview with a venture capitalist who is one of the investors. Now, even playing field fair playing field. And I'm, by the way, I'm supposed to stop in two minutes. I only have about 50 more slides. So I'm going to have to wrap things up. Uh, that team that I mentioned at the outset, they're all panicking that I'm just going to steamroll through this. But let me highlight this, okay? China is not an open in economy. There are some areas that are completely closed to foreign players. Uh, but there are others that are quite open. And China is becoming more open. I don't have time to explain all that's in this chart, but I do want to highlight the big transformation uh, that China is considered at least 50% more open than it was just a couple years ago. This is an important step. And that's key, making the playing field fair. But what we see, what's making China a formidable competitor is that they are investing more heavily in research and development. And so here you have a chart, the, the red line shows China's rising level of investment. This is share of GDP getting up over 2%. And the United States is the global leader at almost 2.8% almost, uh, of GDP going into this, but you see the gap is narrowing. You have to invest. You have to invest in education. You have to invest in a whole lot more. I was going to talk about Huawei, but this will have to be the last slide. We have a lot more. And I, of course, get a chance to talk with you again in just a bit. Uh, Huawei is one of these tech sectors that has become an issue of, with regard to competition and these other considerations. <clears throat>